Welcome to the Fabricators Coach Podcast, where we believe that every fabricator deserves to have a business that not only makes the money, but also gives them time to enjoy it. Well, uh, welcome and uh, happy Thursday. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Fabricators Coach uh, Podcast. We're also doing a webinar at the same time. And what we're going to do uh, in this episode is we're going to do a review of the article that came out in Slippy Rock Gazette in early October called The Power of Sales Follow-Up. Um, if you haven't read the article yet, you can go to slipperyrockgazette.net, select current issue, and they'll have a copy there. They've also got a great archive section for past issues for all their articles. Uh, you can also go to our website, fabricatorscoach.com, and select blog and get a copy of the article there, as well as listen to podcasts, um, download free tools, and some other things. So again, thank you for joining us. A lot of folks ask why we do articles, podcasts, webinars, and the bottom line is we think you as a, as a shop owner deserve to have a business that not only makes you money, but also gives you time to enjoy it. Otherwise, what's the point? And what we do with these, with the content of these articles, podcasts, and webinars is we're, we're trying to give you some ideas for how to work on your business and not just work in your business all the time. That's really the key to moving, moving forward, improving your business, making more profit, and at some point having something that helps you, you know, that has some value that you can cash out and, and execute on your exit strategy at some point. So we're going to talk about this article, The Power of Sales Follow-Up, and one of the questions I like to ask folks a lot is, you know, is this, does these comments describe your sales team? First one is, your salespeople don't respond to customer inquiries in a timely fashion. Maybe not at all. You get a, a lead that comes in and it's a while before somebody follows up on it and some of them fall through the cracks. Um, the next one is uh, maybe you've got salespeople who don't follow up on quotes consistently. Um, some of them have the idea that, okay, well, they've got our quote, they've got our information, they know how to contact us, they want to buy, they'll give us a call. Um, maybe you have salespeople that don't update their your data in your CRM, your customer relationship manager software, or whatever system you use for tracking leads and tracking quotes and sales. Um, you may have sales people who just don't update that data regularly. Uh, these are comments or these characteristics resemble your sales team, or if you are a party of one and you are the sales team and you struggle with these, then chances are you're really wasting some really expensive leads. The cost of acquiring leads continues to increase. Uh, I talked with several people in, in this industry that, that generate leads for fabricators, uh, have done that in the past, and where you could generate a lead for, you know, 20, 40, 50, 70 bucks, you know, 12 to 18 months ago, those costs are substantially higher. It's they're they're running 75, 100, 125 dollars per lead. So these things are getting more and more expensive. The, the cost to acquire these leads continues to increase. My question is, can you afford to continue wasting them? And I want to kind of talk through that scenario a little bit. If if these comments that I made, if these are characteristics of your sales team, you want to, you, you want to know how to manage your team better. The, the webinar last month, the article last month was about some ideas for how to manage your sales team more effectively. And if you're interested, go back and pick that one up. Check the podcast. You can hit Fabricators Coach Podcast on pretty much any of your uh, podcast platforms and, and pick up that recording, or you can go to the, the website or to Slippery Rock and get a copy of the article and read it. That'll, that'll be helpful as well. Let's look at what should be happening with following up on, on leads and with following up on quotes. Uh, I did uh, some research both for this industry from folks who who do this type of work uh, for countertop fabricators, and also some general research for for industry in in general, just to kind of get some some stats here and some ideas of what really should be happening uh, on the subject of the number of follow up attempts. The information says that two percent of sales are made during first contact. So obviously you need a lot more contacts in order to get those sales because you're probably closing higher than 2% of your contacts. And the stats, the data says that 
80% of sales require at least five follow-ups, five times. What's interesting, too, is that about half of salespeople give up after just one follow-up attempt. They call, they can't get an answer, customer hasn't decided, they send an email, don't get a response, they move on to the next one. Very common. What's also true in looking at the data is that only about 10, only about 8% of salespeople will follow up more than five times. When I think about the sales teams that I've seen, when I've been in companies that have had more than one or two salespeople, usually there's about 10% of those teams, 10% of those people that are really high performers. And we tend to think of high performing salespeople as the folks who have the great gift of gab, great product knowledge, lots of contacts, that kind of thing. I think the data tells us that one of the definitions of a high performing salesperson is how many times they follow up. And again, the data says that only about 8% of people, salespeople follow up more than five times. So when it comes to follow up attempts, the answer is definitely more than one. And the data says it's probably five and up. The next topic I looked at was the timing of the follow-up attempts. Uh, what impact does time and aging of these things have? You know, we're not in the business of making fine bourbon that needs to age for you know, 10, 15 years to, to really get a, a good flavor to it. The countertops don't get better with age and these customer leads and, and quotes don't get better with, better with age either. In fact, following up within the first five minutes of receiving a lead means that you are 10 to 20 times more likely to make contact. 10 to 20 times. And that's the follow-up within the first five minutes. And after five minutes, the odds of connecting drop 80%. So... Contrary to, again, fine wine, fine cheese, fine bourbon that gets better with age, your contacts, your, your sales leads, those prospects age out very, very quickly. So within the first five minutes, you're 10 to 20 times more likely to get contact. After five minutes, those odds drop 80% and they get worse from there. Data also shows us that 30 to 50% of sales go to the vendor that responds first. You think about somebody who's scrolling on Facebook or Instagram, they're looking for countertops, they're planning their kitchen renovation or their new home construction or whatever. They reach out to several. They, they're reaching out to the companies that they think they might want to do business with. They get more impressed when they get a quick professional response. And so that time, that that vendor that gets there first has 30 to 50 percent chance of getting that sale. Whereas if you're second, third, or later, those odds go down quite a bit. What I wanted to do, you know, a lot of us have heard these this data, we've heard it in bits and pieces, maybe not pulled together like I've done here all in, in one spot. But what I wanted to do with the article and, and with this podcast was just to kind of walk through and say, okay, what's that mean in terms of dollars and cents? Uh, a lot of follow-up, doing it quickly, having a follow-up routine. That's something a lot of us don't do in this industry. We're a young industry. We're still learning a lot of things compared to other industries. Um, so what's this mean in dollars and cents? Because there's got to be some benefit if I'm going to invest the time and effort to make this happen. So let me give you an example. I'm going I'm to pull some kind of generic stats that seem to fit a lot of the companies, a lot of the fabricators I talk to. And so when we roll this out there, I'm going to say, okay, each lead is costing you a hundred bucks. You can get some cheaper than that. Some of them cost more than that, but a hundred is a good ballpark. Let's say that you follow up on leads. Oh, you know, in about an hour or so, that's kind of your typical mode. And let's say that when you do that, you're making contact with about 10% of the leads that you receive. You're not getting all of them. And of the 10% that you make contact with, let's say that you're quoting half of those. That's pretty normal. And then your conversion rate is, say, 40% in this example. So if you're quoting half the leads, then your conversion rate of those 
of those leads that, you, that you're quoting, you're only converting 40% of those to orders. And for this example, let's say that your average sale is $10,000. So just to kind of take these stats on follow-up that I was talking about and, and put them into dollars and cents, I'm going to use these stats that I just gave you as kind of a baseline example. We're going to walk through, if we make some of the changes that the data tells us, what's the impact on your bottom line? And so the stats, if you look at 100 leads, and we said, okay, you're making contact with 10% of the leads that you received because it's take you, taking you an hour or so to make contact, to do follow-up. So out of those 100 leads, then you're going to contact 10 of them. And we said for our example that when you con that of the leads that you contact, that you're actually going to quote half of those. So if you contact 10 people, you're going to generate five quotes. And then we said your conversion rate in this example was 40%. That means every quote, if you generate 10 quotes, you're going to convert uh, four of those to orders. That's a 40% conversion rate. So in this case, with contact 10, we quote five, just half of them. Conversion rate of 40% means we're going to generate two orders out of those 100 leads. And if our average sale is $10,000, then we got $20,000 in revenue out of those 10 leads. I think when you think about it, offhand, that sounds okay, $20,000 in revenue, depending on the size of the company, you know, that may or may not be a good number for you. The important thing to remember is those 10 leads cost you $100 a piece to acquire. 100 leads times $100 each, that's $10,000. So you spent $10,000 to get 100 leads. You only converted two of those. You got 20,000 in revenue. So $10,000 to get 20,000 in revenue, those are not really good numbers. You can go out of business really quickly doing that. This is not unusual to see this kind of data working with a fabricator. So let's look at what happens if we take some of the advice that those earlier or here's what should be happening stats are that I quoted. Let's look at what the impact of that is. Um, so if we follow up on, on prospects quicker, follow up on these leads quicker, let's say we reduce that hour or so follow up down to five minutes. We, we find a way to do it. It's not necessarily easy. We change how our automated phone system rotates calls around the office. Uh, we make everybody responsible. We put in a two ring rule after the second ring, everybody jumps for the phone, you know, whatever that is. We said, the stats said that if you follow up within 10 minutes, or excuse me, within five minutes on a lead, that you are 10 to 20 times more likely to make contact. So what I'm going to do is say, okay, let's be conservative and say we're only four times more likely. We said that when you followed up within 60 minutes in our baseline example, you made contact with 10 out of 100. So we're going to say four times more likely. So now we're going to make contact with 40 leads. And that's the only change we make is just follow up more quickly within five minutes. Out of those 100 prospects, we follow up, we make contact with 40. And since we're converting half of those contacts into quotes, that means we're going to generate 20 quotes. And we said that when we generate a quote, we have a conversion rate of 40%. So 40% of 20 is eight orders. So by following up more quickly, we went from two orders out of 100 leads, generating 20,000 in sales to eight orders out of those same 100 leads. And now we've got $80,000 in sales. Your lead cost is still $10,000. So for a difference, an improvement of $60,000, you know, whether this is weekly if you're a large shop or monthly or once every two or three months if you're a smaller shop, is it worth $60,000 per 100 leads to find a way to respond to every inquiry within five minutes or less. And when I ask that question of, of fab shop owners, the general answer is yes. And we start figuring out, okay, how do you do that? So one aspect of this power of sales follow-up is that 
we want to follow up very quickly when somebody sends an inquiry, you know, a, a phone call leaves a voicemail because we couldn't answer the phone or they send an email, fill out a form on our website, uh, an inquiry through social media, whatever that is. If we'll just follow up more quickly, do it in about five minutes, we can start to multiply the revenue that we get out of the existing leads that are already coming in. So that's one aspect is just the time aspect. So let's look at what happens to these quotes. You know, we had a 40% conversion rate earlier. Um, let's say, and, and let's say that our normal, in our baseline example, we said we followed up once and that was pretty much it. And that's pretty typical for a lot of salespeople and it's typical in this industry. Let's say we increase that follow-up after a quote from one attempt to at least five attempts. And we said earlier in our in our stats that in our, based on our research that 80% of sales require five or more follow-ups. So let's say we do that. We still got those 40 leads out of the, we make contact with 40 leads out of those 100 inquiries that we got because we're following up within five minutes. We're still generating that same 20 quotes from the example we had in a minute or so ago. And as I'm going through these numbers, I'm thinking, okay, if you're listening, this gets to be hard to follow. It'd be really good if you had a copy of the article to look at because I've got this same data in the article. It'll easier to follow when it's written down. But the value of following up more frequently on quotes is it improves your conversion rate, the conversion from a quote to an order. So let's say in this case that we're still contacting 40 leads, we generate 20 quotes, but instead of a 40% conversion right now, we're going to double it. And instead of getting eight orders out of those 20 quotes, now we're going to get 16. So that means our revenue goes from 80000 to 160000 And our lead cost is still $10,000. And so now we're looking at a change just by following up more quickly on contacts that come in, opportunities to talk to prospects. And then following up more frequently after we generate a quote, we're looking at taking 100 leads that would normally generate $20,000 in revenue, and those same 100 leads could generate upwards of $160,000 in revenue, the same number of leads. So the question, a rhetorical question, if you will, is, is it worth your time to figure out how to follow up on leads quicker? and to make more follow-up attempts on quotes. And again, when I ask this question, I run through this data using a, a fab shop owner's own data. It's not always exactly the same as this. Your mileage may vary, but the answer is always, yeah, it's worth a heck of a lot of money to figure out how to follow up more quickly and how to follow up more frequently. Now, one of the things that, that folks will ask me a lot of times in, in following up is what's what's a good, you know, how do we do follow-ups? If I'm going to follow up more than once, I'm going to follow up five times, is that five phone calls? Is that, um, you know, is that emails? You know, what is it? And so what I outlined in the article is just kind of a rough example of something that may work. And I'm going to re review it real quick. And, and I'm not recommending you follow this specific sequence, but I am strongly recommending that you develop a sequence that is something like this. And what I've got in the article is I show how over 25 days, what a, what a touch of, a, of 11 touches in those 25 days might look like. We'd start off day zero is the quote. Day one is a phone call. And if you don't get them, a voicemail. And then the next day is an email. And then two days later, day four is a text. And then three days later, day seven is an email. Day 10 is a text. And you keep rotating, randomly rotating phone calls, emails, texts. You can incorporate social media messaging. All those kind of things work in there. The idea is that you have a structure. As a sales manager, as the shop owner, you define what that structure looks like. And the last contact in the event that you don't convert this or you don't make contact or yeah and those things don't happen then at some point you got to draw a line and say okay it's time to break up 
And so you're going to have a breakup conversation with the, with the customer, or you're going to leave them a breakup voicemail. Basically, look, I, you know, we've enjoyed talking to you and uh, sorry, we weren't able to meet your needs. Uh, we want to do something different in the future. Please give us a call. But at this point, uh, we're going to go ahead and close your file and thank you for your business and have a great day. And that brings up another point. One is, what kind of voicemail do you want your salespeople to leave? Miss Smith, this is this is it. I gave you a quote yesterday. I hadn't heard back from you. If you guys decide you want to buy this countertop, give me a call. Is that what you want, or do you want something a little more professional? And, and the point here is thinking through what do you want this content to look like? Uh, and then the next point is how do you get your salespeople to do this consistently? And the answer to that is practice, practice, practice. There's a lot of football going on right now. It's fall as we're recording this. Stop and think about the typical starting football player, pros, college, whatever. The game's 60 minutes long, let's say, and, and you don't play, you know, players don't play both offense and defense. It's one or the other. So let's say you're playing defense. And so you're probably going to, you know, the defense is on the field half the time, 30 minutes. Well, even if you're a starter, you're not playing every snap. So your playing time may be 20 minutes, 15, 20, 25 minutes in a game. So that's how much time they'll play on game day. How much time did they spend the prior week preparing to play that 20 minutes? How many hours? How many days? How much film did they watch? How much practice did they run through? How much physical conditioning did they run through? And then stop and think about your salespeople. When do they get to practice? And what's that practice look like? And not that you're going to spend days and days of practice getting ready for 20 minutes of sales calls, but something's better than nothing, certainly. And I think a great tool for practice for salespeople is role play. You figure out what that voicemail probably should be like, then have a sales training session, preferably not during business hours because you want folks to really focus on the training. So find another time to do it, maybe another place. Um, do a little role play. Bob picks up his cell phone. He calls Sue's cell phone, who's in the room with him, but she doesn't answer. He leaves the voicemail you'd like for him to leave and then signs off. And then Sue plays the voicemail. And as a group, you guys critique that, come up with, with good suggestions. And practice over and over till you get it right. Uh, practice having a live phone call. Practice that breakup phone call. You know, those are things that are really important for your salespeople to kind of get comfortable with how you want them to represent your business. I think that's really important to do. Now, you start looking at what I've got in the article with uh, 11 contacts over 25 days. You think, man, emails, texts. Well, how do I manage? How do I do all that? That's a lot of work. Well, first off, go back to our 160,000 versus 20,000 in revenue for the same 100 leads. There's definitely value to figuring this out. The easiest way to do it is use a CRM software package. That's a customer relationship manager software package. With a good CRM, you can automate most of this. If you look at that 25-day 11-touch sequence in the, in the article, there's only three phone calls in there. Everything else in there is emails and text. Well, you can automate a reminder for a salesperson to make a phone call with a good CRM, and you can go ahead and have already composed the emails and the text, and they can go out automatically, untouched by human hands. You just schedule them, and they'll continue to rotate in sequence until you get to that breakup or you, until you lose the order or until you convert the quote to an order. So all that's easily set up with a CRM. There are some of the shop management packages that claim to have some of that capability. I haven't looked at it myself. You may want to examine it really closely. But that's a really important point is you can automate a lot of this with the right software. It's not terribly expensive. If you need some help setting this kind of thing up, want to know some, I know some good resources I can refer to you. Give me a call or, or shoot me an email at ed at fabricatorscoach.com and I'll be glad to talk you through some of these or or I don't set these up, but I know some folks who do. I'm happy to recommend somebody. Um, another thing you can do with a good CRM, you get folks that will contact you 
or try to contact you and never do make contact with them for some reason. Or you get their email address or their phone number because of something you do at a home builder show. You know, you get this information. Well, if you keep it and you put it in your database, then you can use a CRM to do an email campaign. And you're not pestering them to try to get them to buy all the time, but you could offer really good, helpful information. How do you, you know, what's the difference in maintaining a marble countertop compared to quartzite, compared to quartz, compared to granite, you know? What are the differences in the types of uh, edge profiles and, and how, you know, how do you use your kitchen and which edge profile fits your lifestyle better? Uh, what's the benefit of having a chip minimizer edge on your sink cut out? You know, those you know, lots of things that you can offer as helpful information that you can send out on a random basis and keep your company front of mind for somebody who may want to buy six months to a year from now. You know, this is, you think about what we're doing here. Yeah, there's some work in here. There's a little bit of cost in here. Hopefully I've demonstrated and, and shown that there really is a strong financial benefit here. The other thing to keep in mind is that this is still a young industry. This industry has, my first project in this industry was over 20 years ago, and it has grown tremendously in 20 years. I've done a lot of work in a lot of other industries, uh, run plants in other industries, and Compared to metalworking and you know plastics and textiles, and all, we're we're a lot younger industry, so we're still climbing the curve in a lot of ways. One thing I can tell you is, if you implement the things that are in this article, things we've talked about in this podcast, you're going to build a strong competitive advantage because your competition is not doing this. The thing I think it's important as a as kind of a bottom line is that. I think it's pretty clear when you look at the data and you look at what we've walked through here for the last 30 minutes or so, that if you really need to increase sales, you don't necessarily need more leads. You just need to make better use of the ones that you already have. And that's what this is all about, is sales teams perform better, working the numbers, making sure we do the follow-ups quickly and often. Uh, vote early and often comes to mind, but we're talking about really being really um, intentional and being diligent and being consistent about how we do this, because I think it's a tremendous competitive advantage for shops that will invest the time and effort to make this happen. Folks, I want to thank you for spending some time listening to the podcast. I think it's important as a shop owner to understand and, and admit that your business is running exactly the way you designed it to run. And if you're not happy with how it's running, give me a call. Hit the website, press the button, schedule a call. We'll talk. I can do a free customized assessment if you need that, or we can just chat, chat about some challenges that you've got, and I uh, can offer some suggestions to help you out. The uh, next article for uh, November will be Growth Opportunities in an Uncertain Economy. I'll outline some specific business strategies that if we get into a recession, that's still debatable a bit, but it's always good to be prepared. I've got some specific strategies that are worth looking at, and that's what we'll cover in the next article. So look for the article uh, 1st of November in Sydney Rock Gazette, and then uh, a few weeks later, we'll have a, another podcast, another webinar, and talk a little bit about that. So folks, uh, thank you, and I appreciate your time. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fabricators Coach Podcast. If you've got any additional questions about this particular episode or anything else, please check us out at fabricatorscoach.com. Thanks. Have a great day.